Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody. It's the session. Welcome back. It's another Monday, another great show, but this time it's not about craft beer. No, no, no. We wanted to throw things up for you a little bit here in the dead of summer, and we're going back to our home brewing roots. We're going to talk a little bit of homebrew power, homebrew knowledge, homebrew experience, and there's really nobody better to talk about that than Mr. John Palmer. John Palmer, welcome to the session, young man. Hello, hello. Thank you. Wow, I thought you were going to introduce somebody else. I was, <laughs> I was eager, you know. Yeah, like, who is this? I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's been a long time since you've been on the session, and uh, I'm excited to talk to you, man. It's I've been Very hearing good. your voice for the last year while I'm editing Bruce Strong's. Uh -huh. So now it's it's weird to to talk to you and then see you respond like live. That's true. Yeah. I mean. Zoom, what can you say? Yeah, well, otherwise, I'm just, I'm talking to you while you're talking to Jamil on the, the recording of Zoom while I'm while I'm editing, and I'm going, oh, right. John, that was so clever. <laughs> and you don't say anything back, and it hurts my feelings. And then, of course, we're joined by one of my Dr. Homebrew cohorts, Mr. Brian Shar. Hey, hello, how are you this evening? Pretty good, Brian, pretty good. Thanks for joining us as well. I figured uh, I haven't homebrewed in several months, and I don't really know a whole lot about it. So, uh, and I know Brian Shard doesn't know anything either. So I figured the two of us <laughs> can put our, uh, well, I thought it'd be good to get like some of these topics we're going to talk about from like a, a beer judge, you know, uh, uh, profile or beer judge perspective, right? Like we're going to be talking a lot about fermentation design. We're talking mash ton design and maybe potentially off flavors that can come from those things. And so I feel like at the end user, I think Shar, I think you'll uh, you'll do a good job in you know discussing what these things kind of might translate to. Yeah, th thanks, man. I'm I'm consuming some hmm. uh, beer right now, and you know I have not home brewed for about three years, and I'm hoping that by the end of this year to uh, maybe start home brewing again. Uh -huh. I think you should. Um, I personally, I need, I just need to do it. I need to go back to more yeah. beer and just do it. But that Bruzilla from More Beer. Speaking of more beer, they bring you this show. They bring you every session. Morebeer.com, they have absolutely everything you need to make great beer at home, including the Brewzilla, which is a one-vessel system. Lift that mash pipe up when you're done. Sparge over it if you want to. If not, you know, you can probably double batch, and you don't have to sparge a lot like the, yeah. the Pico Brew used to be able to do. And there you go. And you're you're off to, off to the races, man. The thing is lightning fast. It cleans up easy. Under six hours, you're done. Five gallons. You don't have to do anything. You don't have yeah. to do anything. Yeah. That's you know, the way I, I brew I, these days. It's I'm, I'm old and I don't want to have, I don't want to have five gallons. I, I can't drink and I don't want to drink five gallons of something before it gets stale. You know, I right. want to brew yes. a couple of gallons of something, three gallons, maybe two, two sounds real good. I can drink that before I'm bored with it or it gets stale. <laughs> yeah, and I don't have to right. do that in like the space of a week or something, right? I can let that yeah. sit for like a few weeks and enjoy it. And then it's done and it's, it's gone. You know what we should do then? It sounds like you and I need to do a homebrew trade. That's a really good idea. Where we'll just brew different things. Of course, you know, I'll, I have to approve whatever you drink, whatever you brew. For me. <laughs> and then uh, maybe we'll just swap them out. And then that way we can like share because you're right. I brewed five gallons of beer that again, with that stupid mild with Kvaik yeast hmm. turned out amazing, turned out yeah. great. And yeah. then <clears throat> Palmer, I know, and actually I got the idea from that um the all one show we did yep the escarpment show i think okay yeah yeah um and uh talking about all the different variations of quike and all this kind of whatnot and i'm like you know what i think for some reason I go a mild this would this would work really well but and i guess we'll just jump into into homebrewing <laughs> um after three or four weeks the there started to be this sort of tang and it mm. wasn't i don't think it was a contamination it was more like that sort of sour, tangy, different, almost tart flavor that I've heard you know, Kvike yeasts can give off. Uh, we've had some on Dr. Homebrew a couple times, and they can get, it was the same sort of vibe. And I don't think it was contamination, although mm -hmm. it, you know, could be I'm not about which, which, uh, which variety of Kvike are you using? It was the, oh, uh, God, Omega yeast. Okay, that's that's a Hornendal. I think so. I can't remember. They have like three or four. It was like yeah, a yeah. package with a really cute otter on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Is that yeah. why you bought it? Because it had the key daughter on, on it, it? Yeah. Well, because this one, I think, was like it said it was more fruity. Um, and I thought that would go well. Anyway, it turned out really well. So I wanted to do an ESB with it, but I haven't, I just haven't had the chance to drive out to more beer and get some ingredients. So, yeah. I brewed I, I like a Munich. idea of an exchange. Sorry. Sorry, Palmer. Go ahead. Oh, I brewed a Munich Dunkel uh, a couple of times this year. Um, nice. With my anvil all in one system, two and a half mm -hmm. gallon with the little mini torpedo kegs. Love it. Got it <laughs> in more beer. And uh, yeah, but the, I used the, the Lalem and uh, Quike uh, Voss strain, I believe. Um, That's what it is. That. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. I think. Okay. I don't remember. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that one, that one turned out great. Um, I, I fermented that at 90 using a firm wrap and mm -hmm. um, the, uh, so Munich Dunkel, 90 degrees, Lalem and you know, Quike. Um, nice and clean, just a beautiful drinking beer, but I only had two and a half gallons and it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the downside, Char, that we're going to, we're going to go with. It's like, whenever we brew something good, you're like, oh man. Well, anyway, back to that. Yeah. It's still sitting in my, in my fridge. Yeah. Huh? Not because I got bored with it, but like, I'm trying not to drink so much. And this is very different than when I was 25 or 30. Yes. Yes. I, I like, drink oh, a lot gallons. less than I did even like five years ago. Uh, I drink significantly less. And good because right. we, we should. We're not built That's correct. as much as, uh, yeah. Speaking of drinking things, it's, what do you It's not drink? a competition. No, it's not. Although <laughs> in your 20s, it is for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, in your 50s, not so much. <laughs> or you got a serious problem. Yeah, we're both. Uh, Palmer, what are you drinking on, man? You're drinking on Ten something special, right? Yeah. Tonight, um, I'm drinking the Tomahawk Barrel Aged Imperial Pastry Stout that was aged in a Jack Daniels barrel. I brewed this with my friends, uh, Sergio, Ignacio, and Juan um, of, uh, Sergio's from uh, Bogota, South America, um, Colombia, uh, Tom Hawk Brewery. Ignacio is from uh, Trente Cinco of Costa Rica, Costa Rica. And um, <laughs> Juan Jamarillo is uh, Har Jaramillo. I can, boy, I'm slurring today. Uh, he's, he's from a brewery that I can't quite remember in Quito, Ecuador. Oh. And we got together and did this collab brew um, and barrel aged it. And uh, uh, another friend uh, came up from Panama to LA a month or so ago and brought me a couple bottles. And I must say, it's fantastic. It's, it's even though it started out as a pastry stout, the barrel aging and souring has dried it out. Mm -hmm with not you know, a real aggressive layer uh, layer of sourness to it. So it's, it's just a very nice, nice drinking beer. That sounds good, man. That sounds really cool. It's a lot of uh, South American influences, I guess, or. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, yeah, we used, um, we used cocoa. We used uh, some other spices from the area, which escaped me at the moment. Maybe they're on the bottle. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's in Spanish. Ah. Oh man, just try, just double <laughs> your way through it, man. Agua, aguardiente. Um, let's see. Water. So, rich in uh, antiguos aromas. Yeah. Okay, so rich of aromas of rum and aguardiente, which is uh, water of life. Okay. Um, you know, South American spirit. Sounds cool to me. Anyway, I'm not really fantastic a beer. guy, but I, I would I would try that for sure, man. That sounds great. Well, Char, what about you? Before we you know really dig into home brewing, because we don't have any beer to taste, so we got to drink our own. Stuff. <laughs> I I am drinking a uh, Ghost Town Hazy Pale Ale uh, with uh, Nelson uh, Sauvin and Equinot hops. Uh, yes. I I got this not because it's hazy, but more because. Uh, although looking at your reaction, I maybe subconsciously, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to drink this on the show. And JP is going to just like vomit, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I just, I love Nelson's Sauvin hops. And this is like a nice, uh, really fresh pale ale. Awesome. Uh, there's, there's a good, Wait, that's uh, a pale ale. Never mind. Like, I don't want to get into it. Never mind. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's with lighting Stop and everything showing else, it. right? Stop. I'm going to turn hazy your video pale. Off. There it is. There it is. Hazy pale. Uh, <laughs> It's like someone There's, dissolved aspirin in lemonade. Um, <laughs> it doesn't taste like that, but Good. yeah, I can believe that that's how aspirin dissolved in lemonade might look. Good. 
Yeah. Like an Alka Seltzer, you popped into like a stale old lemonade that's been sitting out for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like something my daughter forgot in the kitchen and like, oh yeah, I'm just going to pour some Alka Seltzer in there. Uh, I wouldn't actually ever do no. that. Uh, but no, the uh, this is super fresh. And, uh, you know, I'll give a shout out to Little Marina Market in downtown Martinez. They've got a really big selection of craft beer and it's mm-hmm. usually pretty fresh. So you could get a lot yeah. of stuff. Awesome. I should have gotten a pastry stout. They had several one can pastry stouts. You didn't oh, have to buy God. the whole four cat four pack. I could have drank that with Palmer. See, True. I myself am drinking. I'm drinking. This is the only Lagunitas beer that I think I'm going to ever drink. It's not even a beer. Uh, uh, or hop, uh, uh, hoppy uh, uh, refresher. Uh, uh, it's the zero alcohol, essentially like um, hop flavored carbonated water. And it's delicious. Yeah. I've, I've never seen that before. It. They um, are. Uh, I got it at Bevmo. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. They're, you know, uh, statewide at least. But um, you know, seven bucks for a four pack. It's cheaper than a lot of beers for a four pack, and it just tastes like candy. Hmm. It's the. I don't know what. I don't know what hops are in it, and I'd be interested to like talk about it because, um, I think I heard like to develop it, they were having a hard time until they were adding brewer's yeast. To get to, to whatever the yeast does with the hops, because it's like they use powdered hops. Uh-huh and brewer's yeast with water and that's it and like some minerals so whatever the yeast is doing to like even the body or maybe the just the mouth feel in general Mm -hmm. i don't know but it's like it's it it's like um it's like a lightly candied fruited hard seltzer without the alcohol they're Mm -hmm. delicious i love them so much i drink a lot of seltzer water so that that'd be a nice alternative (laughs) me too but you can't have for me you can't have more than one in a row Oh. You should have the one, and it's a nice, like, yeah. nice know. change. Yeah. It's a nice change, man. It's a nice change. Um, I do see a lot of questions coming over on Facebook. I appreciate that, guys. We'll get to those probably, I don't know, either whenever, probably later. But uh, Palmer, let's get into a little bit of home brewing information. Sure. Sure. Uh, we were going to talk a little bit in the beginning about uh, mash tun design and loudering and stuff like that and, and how that can really um you know either make or break your your home brewing setup and, and ultimately sure. your satisfaction with home brewing right right so where do we start with uh with home brewing design you know i know most of us aren't designing our own mash tons but i think there's information there that we should be aware of yeah yeah it's it's funny how much home brewing has changed in the last 30 years isn't it <laughs> yeah I mean, it used to be you had to make your own mash tun you didn't have any choice yeah. Nowadays, it's so much easier to buy an, an all-in-one system like the Brusilla or the Foundry or Grandfather. You know, I mean, there's there's a bunch of them out there now. Um, but yeah, time was, you know, you had to make your own mash ton out of a, a picnic cooler or a beverage cooler. And um, false bottoms were it's something that you had to make. This is how Charlie Papazian came up with his bucket in a bucket system, drilling holes in one bucket and laundering in another. Um, but yeah, um, the way you design a mash ton helps your overall efficiency. How much sugar do you get from the mash, from the grain? And uh, today, um, brew in a bag systems have come along in the last 20 years. And that steps away from a lot of the mash tun considerations because you're simply mashing in a container, lifting out the grain in a bag and leaving all the work behind. Kind of a no sparge setup, or you can sparge a little bit if you want. And we'll talk about sparging more in a minute. But um, I think we've, it, when I was first homebrewing, we talked, we worried a lot about efficiency and how to extract the sugars from the mash because we have would have like a single slotted pipe in the bottom of the cooler or just a a, a screen over the end of the tube stuck in there and efficiency was generally pretty low like 60 percent um which isn't which isn't great 80 to 90 percent is better 
Um, as you move to a false bottom system, then you can get like the 90% efficiency where, you know, all of the wort is coming out of the grain bed, you sparge uniformly, you, you know, and drain off, you know, you rinse the grain bed and drain off more wort. And yeah, you're approaching 90% efficiency or almost, almost laboratory, you know, type efficiencies. Um, the trade-off though, is when you aim for such high efficiency with, you know, multiple rinses of the grain bed, then you start running the risk of astringency from the grain husks. So there is this, this balance on how much efficiency you shoot for, you know, in terms of money versus quality of the wort. Yeah. And I do remember uh, when we, when I was working at Morbier years ago, uh, you know, sort of making some of those pipe manifold style false bottoms for lack of a better term right the manifold and there was a big um i think he was even talking about nhc a couple times like how how much your your runoff speed and your sparge speed right. varied in your in your gravity and how much sugars you were extracting because you can get dead zones if you're pulling too much water out you're you're missing the back corners right Right. That. And maybe if you're even going slow, because you have to really make sure all your corners are covered. That's why a false bottom was always inherently the best way to go. That's right. But back then they were so expensive. So, and like you're saying, homebrewing has sort of changed. I, I think, uh, even mm -hmm. though I'm sort of outside looking in now, but it's, it's no longer about how to save as much money as possible. And that's right. how, like, you just would always get people into the hobby. Like, oh, do you know how much money that you could save? You mm -hmm. just go to Home Depot. Mm -hmm. And get a bunch of copper and you know already now that's like 50 bucks <laughs> You're like okay yeah. what am i going to do now i don't i just i just have copper i don't have anything else so now it's more about the enjoyment and brewing the beers that you want and i think that honestly sort of mirrors the the craft movement as well yeah it was about yeah. oh you know support your local craft brewery or uh you know independent is better and, and all this kind of you know fun stuff and then now it's just like well what beer is good and I think it's sort of like the same transition where everything has its own, like, you know, backstory and its own arc, its own character arc. So now I think mm. the arc of homebrewing is, it's just enjoyment. Prices yeah. are lower a little bit on equipment, but I, I don't, where I don't hear people trying to really go super cheap anymore. Right. Because they, we still do sort of chase extraction. Like when I first tried to brew on the Brusilla, I was worried because again i hadn't brewed up until then for a couple years uh, on like an actual system even longer than that i was brewing the zymatic and then i just didn't really care but it's like what's my efficiency going to be i've never i've never mm. brewed on this before i have no idea i can't i don't know it doesn't have its own software to tell me what to do mm. and uh, ultimately i think it was just fine yeah, really yeah. Matter. you know i use beer smith and uh and they have a calculation for it and everything's like oh why didn't i do this before yeah. Well, yeah, you were saying craft, you know, the arc of craft brewing um, has followed the arc of home brewing. And I think home brewing has followed the arc of, you know, craft baking and craft, you know, cuisine, um, slow yeah. cooking. Um, you know, it's, it's moved from saving money and just, you know, doing it to get to go against the man versus, hey, you know, I, I've discovered this really interesting recipe or, you know, that guy has, you know, on YouTube has a really interesting recipe. I'm going to try to copy that and see what it tastes like. Yeah. Um, and so like, I mean, we like this, this barrel aged pastry stout. It was an idea um, we had and, you know, we just started bouncing ideas off each other, you know, like other collab brews do in, in craft brewing. And uh, we came up with something really cool. But yeah, going back to mash, mash ton design, I mean, the equipment available today makes it so much easier. Basically, the purpose of the mash, for those that are new to brewing, is simply to provide the conditions, the temperature and the pH necessary for the starches to convert to sugars. And once you've done that, then to get them out away from the grain. Um, so and that's where false bottoms and efficiency versus manifolds and so on uh, enters in the picture. Mm -hmm. Today's all-in-one systems like, you know, grandfather and such, um, they have false bottoms in them. The grain sits in a pipe. So at the end of the mash, 
you simply raise the pipe up, rest it on the rim, or of the it it it's, it inherently stacks, and all the work can drain out. <clears throat> and doing a no spa no sparge that is a no rinse brew that way is a great way to get a very high quality wort. Um, you end up with less wort volume in terms of what you, the amount of grain you use, and your efficiency drops down to say 70%. But, you know, grain is still roughly a dollar, maybe a dollar fifty a pound, depending on the variety, pretty cheap. So we spend another dollar, another dollar fifty, you know, to, to make up for that uh, loss in efficiency. Yeah. You've got your full boil volume of great tasting first runnings wort, you know, as like the Asahi people to love to say. And uh, yeah, you know, you've got great wort and you're going to make a great beer. And then you just top off with just normal water in the, in the boil kettle, I guess, to get up to your pre-boil. Uh, yeah, if it, yeah, you can you can handle it both ways. You can either um, figure out through software or the charts and how to brew how much grain and how much water you need to end up with your boil volume, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with no water additions, or you brew a high gravity wort and then dilute it in the in the boil kettle before you boil. Yeah, either way, and you can dodge uh, stringency that way. Char exactly. Uh, how at, at the end product, how important is astringency to avoid? Like, is it one of those things like a contamination where it's just going to kill your beard? You know, you really need to be careful or is there sort of a sliding scale with how much is too much? Well, if we I'm are going to, uh, going to give you my lawyer answer, which is it depends. Okay. <laughs> it depends on, on how astringent it is really. Okay. Uh, frankly, I don't run into astringency as a problem in homebrew very often. Mm -hmm. not in 2021 maybe 15 years ago there was more of that you know I, I think to me the more important thing and John I'm curious what you think of this whatever your efficiency is it's more important to be consistent and yeah. if you're trying to just chase that last you know dollars worth of sugar out of your grain uh, that's where you end up doing things that can cause astringency and you, what you save the dollar, but you've made some beer that's so mouth puckering and and so uh, I'm chewing on grapeseed uh, type. <laughs> that it's just not worth worth drinking. So right. uh, you know, I, I think astringency sometimes it's hard to. It, that's the thing that can be hard to pick out because sometimes you can mistake that for other things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in a sour beer, for example, somebody might say, "Oh, that's astringent," but really what you're tasting is is sourness like a lactic yeah. sour or something like that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you taste, you know, a quote astringency and maybe it might be bitterness, right? Uh, I, I think there's, it's one of those things that other, other flavors and other mouthfeels kind of, you know, are in the yeah. neighborhood. So to me, to be, for astringency to be a problem, you've got to really, You've got to really go for it, man. You've got to really grind that <laughs> that that grain yeah. so fine that there's all that husk is gone. You've yeah. got to got to sparge that at you know two hundred, uh, and even then, you know, I, I've I've been a listener of the session and of Bruce Strong and other shows for you know long, long, long time, and I've heard all kinds of crazy mash regimes and crazy sparge regimes from people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, home brewers and commercial brewers who have made excellent beer. So I, you know, maybe this was an issue when Papazian first wrote his book in the seventies. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't see it being that much of an issue today. Uh, well, and when I it still is, you've got to really try. Yeah. I still get astringent beers in competition, yeah. both homebrew and craft. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, one, two, you know, not, it's, 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 not uncommon, but it's not common either. You're, you're right. It is. It's less common today than it was, um, because I think people understand water chemistry and pH a lot more today right. than they did 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it's still there, and it's 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 astringency is you know can be various degrees. It can be very light, 
you know, just a slight drying on the back of the mouth and back of the tongue. And it can be very puckering, very astringent where you notice it from the first, you know, sip, almost like wine tannin astringency. Yes. Um, so, but yeah, with, with the brewing methods and our de-emphasis on economy and efficiency, we've moved away from you know, that over sparging, over rinsing of the grain bed, which tended to result in pH rise and the accompaniment, you know, uh, extraction of uh, tannins. Um, commercial brewers, though, you know, craft brewers, they are fighting the economy, um, you know, the economics of true. the brew. So there is, there is the need to understand um, where, you know, what your, your mash liquor ratio is, um, you know, to get your running, you know, your first runnings versus your second runnings, you know, dialing one up, dialing one down, um, maintaining pH of the grain bed yeah. through it during, during the water. And it's funny, so many of the, the issues that home brewers have tried to address over the years are, uh, what do you call them? projected issues from commercial <laughs> brewing yes you know interesting th things that they have to deal with on a daily basis that really are very minor or unapplicable to the small scale of home brewing um right. so you know that's and that, that that took everyone kind of a while to learn i mean um you know fly sparging false bottoms you know rinsing multiple rinsing of grain beds to you know improve efficiency that was the way the commercial brewers did it so that must be the way we have to do it mm. <laughs> and we've learned differently and you make a good point john about the ph that it's not just about rinsing that ph is really an important factor because when i first heard about decoction mashing like 20 years ago oh, yeah. before i'd ever brewed an all grain beer i read about this decoction stuff uh, and I would listen, hear about it on you know, the session or other places and think, you know, wait, you're going to boil grain? You're going to get this? <laughs> yeah. doesn't, isn't that the same? Isn't that how you get a stringency? This sounds like a terrible idea. Uh, but then I learned about, you know, the fact that it's, the pH is different than if you're just pouring hot water over grain repeatedly. Uh, and the pH is, if, to, to have a stringency, you have to have not just uh, a temperature, be really high, but you have to have pH be outside of a, a optimal range to have right. that happen. But ten, tends to be above six. Yeah. You okay. Notice I said optimal range and let you fill that in because I knew you could <laughs> do that and I didn't know what that range was. Smart. Fair enough. That's that's good podcasting right there. Yeah, we'll make a host yeah. for you yet, Brian. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> how does how does a uh, mash tun shape? How does the vessel overall influence any sort of uh you know flow of of liquid or whatever I mean, we covered a little bit of the the false bottom and how that acts in drawing yeah. the water or the work but how does that how does the overall shape matter well um it matters in it as far as the kind of laudering device you have so if you have a false bottom um you know, generally then at least the homebrew level, homebrew scale, five, 10, maybe even 20 gallons, uh, the false bottom will adequately, you know, drain the grain bed. Mm -hmm. And we're talking grain beds in the, on the homebrew scale, maybe up to a foot deep, you know, um, hard, hard to exceed that really at the homebrew scale. Um, but when you get to commercial brewing, they're dealing with louder tons that are, you know, 20 feet across and a grain bed that it could be two feet or even you know more deeper and so there they actually have to have multiple pickup points across underneath the false bottom mm, okay. to ensure good flow and that's where you see in you know vintage photos you see these goosenecks mm -hmm. going into a sink or looks yeah. like a sink anchor steam has those yeah yeah. Those are the, the outlets from the multiple pickup points underneath the lauder ton. And they all feed ah. to a common lauder grant. Mm. And so as the brew as the brewer is watching the laudering process, if they see one really flowing heavily 
and another flow and not so much, they can adjust that flow, you know, with the, on the, on the gooseneck to, uh, you know, drain more evenly across that grain bed. Because I, as you get into great big grain beds, now you get the channeling problem where you have maybe a, a shallow spot or a spot next to the wall or next to the rake or something where it's a lot easier for water to flow past mm -hmm. and you could get low extraction from the grain and, and near that. So John, let me back up a second. What's the difference between a mash ton and a lauder ton? Mm. Ah, the ever persistent question. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good question. <clears throat> well, um, in homebrewing, we often talk about mash lauder tons. That is, we put the grain into a cooler, we hit it with hot water, and then when the mash is done, we drain from that cooler. So it, is, it serves both functions as a mash ton and a lauder ton. But in commercial brewing, um, most craft breweries have a four vessel system, at least some of the larger ones do, and most, and, and larger breweries as well, because that allows you to do a mash and then pump that mash to the lauder ton where you'll sparge it. Meanwhile, you could start another mash behind it. So and that's then, why they do it is for process efficiency on a commercial scale. That right. you're not sitting around waiting. You've mashed, move it on, get the next one in. Yeah. And depending on the system, they could do okay. two mash mashes to fill the boil kettle, or they could you know, boil each batch as it comes along. And just, it's a matter of production efficiency. Yes. Okay. They don't, they're not, and then, they're not tied to that one, that one ton. No, that's, that's really cool. And then what's a grant. I know what that is, I think, but for mm -hmm. the listeners, see, I, sure. I, I'm, a lot of, a, a lot of grant yeah. is like a large tub and it's um, you feed the, goosenecks or you feed the outlets from the mash ton from the lauder ton i should say you feed the outlets from the lauder ton into this common tub and then there you pump wort from that to the, the kettle and what this does is it acts as a suction break so if you were pumping directly from the lauder ton to the kettle you may start preferentially pulling from one section yeah. of the lauder ton closest to the, the outlet. And again, uh, you know, differences of flow, differences of extraction, differences of efficiency. You also might have cavitation in your pump or something. If you go to yeah. pump and there's nothing there that second, but the grant kind of collects it so that there's always fluid there to pump, right? Right, right. Yeah, you can, you can, you keep that grant, you know, half full and, and yeah. pump from there. And it just, it, it, this uh, saves problems. I, you know, I, it just, so I've been doing, look, I've been home brewing since like 1999. Okay. Uh -huh. And I just, it just now dawned on me that loudering is a verb and the louder ton is a vessel specifically for loudering. Ah, yeah, yeah. I just, I never, I, I, never, <laughs> I never figured it out because I also sort of grew up with the mash louder ton. Oh, and yeah. That, in home brewing, we just, that's the, we use the one term. It was a, a slash, mash it's slash. The mash ton. ton. Yeah. You just, yeah. Just one vessel for both. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I guess I never really figured it out and never really cared enough to ask a question about, well, specifically what, like what. But now, exactly. But now, John, you, you solved my problems. It sounds like, you can have a mash ton that's a fucking triangle, but as long as your false mm -hmm. bottom is shaped appropriately. Yep. Yep. So that's kind of good news. We, if we're, we are building a system, we can just do whatever, as long as we're drawing, as long as the sparge water is covering all of the grain and we're pulling that evenly. Yeah. Or yeah. even if it, even if it's not covering all the grain, as long as, as long as we're a, we're adjusting for that. So if we want a right. gravity that's 1060 starting gravity, but the way we're sparging, it, we're getting 1050. Well, either you can break your system down and you can stress about it. You can go, but I need to get this efficiency or you can throw two pounds of malt, a base malt in yeah. and try it you again. Get it that way. Yeah. Yeah. You get? yeah. I mean, you know, you brought up a great point. I mean, so many things we take for granted. And as I was working on the latest edition of How to Brew, I asked myself, you know, well, I know what 
Trube means. I know what Kreuzen means, these German words, but I don't know what louder means exactly other than, you know, something to do with rinsing, but that that's sparge. Sparge means to sprinkle in German, something like that. So I emailed a German friend of mine, and he said that um, louder means to clean, clarify, or purify, you know, that kind of meaning. And so what the louder process is a clarification of the word. You know, in the mash tun, you, you, when you draw off that first runnings, it's cloudy. It's got bits of grain. It's got, you know, all that, you know, protein and so on. It's cloudy coming through. And so you, you recirculate that or Vorloff, as they say, Vorloff meaning preliminary. Right. Um, and uh, so, I mean, you know, the, this was, these lit several, you know, uh, you know, bells in my head too, uh, you know, in terms of, oh, okay, that's why we do it this way. And that's where these words come from. Um, and it makes sense. You know, when you, when you start drawing off the word, you recirculate it, you vorl off it, you clarify it, you purify it, running through the grain bed again, kind of filtering it, and mm -hmm. you get a clearer word out. That's the loudering process. Um, and okay. I yeah. thought laddering and sparging were the same thing. Yeah, no, it's because slightly as, different. As you're learning homebrewing, the language of homebrewing, as you just pointed out, it relies heavily on the language of German. Yeah. I just figured that louder was a, was a sparging in German or whatever. I don't know. I just, uh, it's why I don't learn too well, because I just go, eh, I mean, I get the gist of it. I don't really care what it's called, but there's a certain right. like historical fascination with it. Right, right. Yeah. Um. Anything else about mashing, uh, mash ton design, mash flow we should learn, or should we take a break and come back and start on fermentation? Uh, we could. Um, I think the, the, to close the, the terms of mash ton design and sparging mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, as a home brewer, <clears throat> if you're getting 75, 80% efficiency, that's great you are going to have a high quality wort, very minimal chance of astringency. And um, that's really all you need to worry about. As you move into commercial brewing, you know, 75 could be 80, 80 could be 85. And you're, you know, and as long as you are on top of your game, then your wort will be high quality and you're saving money. Um, and, and as you move up to the Anheuser-Busch level, then, then you're talking about 90% yeah. plus. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, and it, so mash and design um, is pretty fluid. Don't get your grain bed too deep. You know, the, um, six inches a foot maximum is kind of where I think it, it should be. Hey, you could go up to 18 inches and, and in, like the Brusillas, where you have a tall uh, mash pipe that all your grain, grain sits in, those can be 18, 20 inches. Um, it works fine for that because mainly you're draining. You're not trying to, you're not trying to pump from that very deep grain bed. Um, okay. And that that's a key key difference there. You want to uh, modern systems. We learned the uh, the the value and wisdom of draining versus pumping. Um, then, uh, let's see, brew in a bag, you know, you step away from that, you're simply, you know, in a mesh bag, you raise the grain out of, out and let that drain back into the kettle mm -hmm. and you start your boil. So, um, yeah, very le less concerned with efficiency in that case. <laughs> yeah, that's more ease of use. But yeah. again, we've talked about how to add to that. And you can even just throw a pound of DME in the boil kettle too. It doesn't Yeah, if grain. you miss your numbers. But generally, yeah. generally, if you plan on 70% as a, as a number, um, mm -hmm. you'll be fine. You'll, you'll hit your numbers every time. Okay. Fascinating stuff. Palmer, hang on a second. Char, you can hang on too. I guess that's fine. <laughs> better than you throw me off of the, off of the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Palmer, hang on. Char, 
we got it. You've you've been voted uh, uh, off the, off the podcast island. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, everybody, hang on real tight. We're going to be right back. We're going to be talking pressure and fermentation, ester production, maturation, all that kind of sort of, uh, you know, post mash, uh, post boil stuff like that. Hang on. It's the session and we'll be right back with the great John Palmer and the uh, approaching uh, sort of great Brian Char. Back after. Well, thank you. All right. Thanks for hanging around, everybody. We are back with John Palmer and Brian Shar, and we're doing some homebrew stuff today, maybe a little bit more elevated homebrew stuff than we've done in the past, but uh, homebrew stuff nonetheless. But I think what I want to do is cruise through some of these um, questions on Facebook, Palmer, if that's all right. Sure. Yeah. Just do that first a little bit and then, uh, you know, to break things up. By the way, I started drinking this organic cider from Sam Smith's. Oh, Samuel Smith, I, uh, man, so obviously I went to, uh, you'll have to excuse my painted nails, by the way. My daughter <laughs> wanted to paint my nails, and I said, sure. Of course. Um, I went dads to, do. Yeah. I went to BevMo mm -hmm. the other day and just, like, went wild. I just spent a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, went through, like, the, you know, the, the German aisle, and that's where they have, like, the English beers. And uh, I was like, oh, my God, Sam Smith's Nut Brown Ale. I haven't had a Sam Smith's Nut Brown in, like, eight years or whatever. It's a little sweeter than I remember, but it's still so good. And their cider's pretty good. I, mean, I like English style cider, and it's a uh, semi semi dry, I guess. Uh, Sam Smiths are always really good. Tasty, yeah, it's good, especially since they moved to the brown bottle. Those yeah. clear bottles were ass, but the brown right. bottle, yeah, they were. Man, they were pretty good. This is a Twenty First Amendment uh, West Coast IPA. It's their Twenty First Anniversary IPA. Oh, nice. that I'm drinking right now. It's uh, quite tasty. I'm. Not sure what the malt bill is, but it's got kind of a perfumey, pilsnery type of uh, flavor and aroma. So sounds I'm guessing good. there's a big chunk of, of pilsner malt in here. <laughs> yeah, sounds good, man. It's pretty um, tasty. All right. Uh, Ron says, have you ever brewed with spruce tips? I have not, but I've had some amazing spruce tip beers. Yeah. Same? Yeah. Um, if you're going to brew with spruce tips, make sure you just get the fluorescent green tips not the branch not the branch yeah and i've i've been brewed with uh, brand juniper branches and spruce branches in norway mm -hmm. different variety than what we have here in north america oh, really okay yeah so juniper, you know not juniper it's just it's, right yeah. it's it's a different bush and uh so yeah if you I, I can imagine somebody trying to brew with actual juniper branches here in North America. <laughs> that would be, that would be nasty. Yeah. Um, absolutely. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, you, all you got was a tea like flavor in yeah. the wort with the Norwegian juniper. Interesting. Okay. All right. I love it. Love to see it. Yeah, you want to talk about astringency, you know, Put, putting yeah. tree branches in your mash is probably a good, probably as good a way as any to get astringency. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, let's throw a whole tree in here and see what happens. Yeah, that's that's a bad idea. Yeah. Right, right. Um, Ron, again, says, what do you think of the new NHC score slash comment sheets from the Nationals? I don't have any experience in this, so I don't really know what he's saying. I uh, haven't seen them, unfortunately. Okay. Are these the brand new ones that people were all angsty about? From I think so. I think so. Yeah, I, I, I did not judge this year, so I would not know. Yeah, okay. are they? They're probably kind of GABF like, maybe. That's what I'm. That's what I'm. My understanding is they're they're less feedback. Right. Because at that point, you've been through the first round is their thing, but it's also, I don't know. I remember getting them a while ago. I don't know if they've changed yeah. since then, but it wasn't the best because it felt like. I mean, you got to tell me, tell me why I, I didn't, I right. didn't win. I don't, you know, I don't <laughs> know what you're not tasting. Cause at the same time, I've already gotten all that feedback in the first round. So I just want, you know what? You could even forego all of that shit and just, ex just give me a paragraph as to why. Why you didn't win. Yeah. yeah. I don't need yeah. a second round score sheet. Yeah. Yeah. But, a GABF judging is unique. Um, you've got these pads and i guess in the last year i was there they switched to ipad everything you know you bring your laptop bring your ipad and do it electronically same kind of form right. but you know with the i mean we were doing three rounds in the morning three rounds in the afternoon 
nine to 10 beers per round and trying to fill out, you know, score sheets or at least comments and check off, you know, how these things rank. Um, incredible, you know, time commitment. Um, and so maybe they've moved to kind of the same form for NHC second round. And I can see that. I mean, yeah, you should have gotten your feedback first round. And I think, well, I, I remember reading uh, somebody's blog post saying that, um, you know, NHC has moved away from feedback on your homebrew to being a competition. So, yeah, I mean, a paragraph, you know, an exp explanation of why this beer didn't place is because there were others that were better or, we, you know, this suffered during transportation or, you know, something that would be, you know, useful feedback. Yeah. Um, but I remember, you know, judging both NHC and GABF and Brian, you can probably echo this is where you, you are struggling to define, determine which one of these two beers is better, you know, and, you know, you fall back on the style guideline. Oh, this one's a little too dark, you know, <laughs> I mean, because <laughs> they both taste amazing, you know, and where, which one do you award this prize to or which one's the winner? It, it can be tough. It's, it's really tough. I mean, for anyone that's, ever, that's listening that's ever entered uh, NHC, uh, I've had the privilege to judge second round NHC probably four or five times. Uh, and it, it is, it's, it's weird to say, but it, it's that, that intangibles aspect that it comes down to a lot of the time. Hmm. Now for some of those beers, you will be judging those and think, how did this make it from the first round? And I, in fairness to the entrance and the competitors, I think that those beers, when you get them and they don't taste good, that's either age or uh, a hurried rebrew. Yeah, yeah. Maybe is somehow oxygenated or something. Okay, yeah. Uh, but Bad bottle. It's, it, it comes down to like, like doing best of show at a big competition. It's the same thing. It comes down to such tiny, fine lines of... Uh, of what which beer is more close to the platonic ideal of that style right you know i i was on best of show for the first uh, uh sam adams long shot uh which in in not national but in the west coast here in san francisco mm -hmm. uh and i was on the panel with a bunch of folks who are good friends who i respect a lot and i respect their opinion a lot and we probably went around for two hours uh maybe three hours uh fighting over like two of these beers and it was the tiniest well, this one is just a little bit more. I don't. I don't want to uh, get into the details for obvious reasons. This yeah. one's a little bit more than of X remember. that it should be. <laughs> I, I do, but I don't want to. You know, okay. But regardless, no. uh, you know, it does get into really uh, intangible aspects. And when when you're when you have the best beers in the country or in the in the Western Hemisphere, the world, in some instances. It, it's really tough to pick who's the best one. Yeah, yeah, and I guess it's even harder to explain why. This is exactly. kind of what you're saying, I think, too. And so I guess my idea of just tell me why doesn't really – It's not you're not yeah. breaking up with me. <laughs> you're, mm. you're not awarding me a thing. But, you know, and I think, Palmer, you're right, where I think they are smart to move away from commentary on your beer. And that was how we originally – I say we, people in the home brewing industry right. like us, so eventually helped – the um competition community by saying enter these beers for feedback this is good feedback right but yeah. now it, it's not like that because it's it's overwhelming and also we have dr homebrew so if anybody's listening who wants to enter your homebrew for genuine feedback and it's a q a you get to ask questions from these knuckleheads Email brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. Not Char, but Cooper. Anyway, brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. We'll get you on Dr. Homebrew. Send us your homebrew, and we'll get you on the show. And we'll talk to you about it, and you can ask questions. Yeah. And after three rounds, tasting the eighth beer in the flight, good <laughs> Lord, you know, it's just like, yeah, this isn't very good. What should I write? <sighs> It's, you know, uh, the uh, alcohol uh, level starts to get to you after a while. I oh did, my God! I I did, I did strong beer at at Philadelphia NHC. 
whatever that was probably what like seven or eight years ago ten right. years that was ago. a great one though yeah that was a really great great yeah, nhc fun. and i was on I, I did but there were 13 different uh american barley wine english barley wine like the strongest styles and we're trying our best but by beer 10 we're like showing each other pictures of our kids. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just, hey, geez, but this is my daughter, and this is the thing. Where are your kids? No, no we gotta judge more. Uh, and that that's also a, a factor for some of those styles where you have thirteen regions, uh, where everyone's doing their best. But sometimes number thirteen, after you've had twelve already, uh, might not get the best. Someone has to go in last place in that judging. Someone has to get judged 13th, huh. and that may or may not help you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, moving on, one last question, then we'll get to fermentation. I think this will be a good segue. Um, Palmer, this is probably going to be mostly for you. This is from William. He says, I recently picked up some used corny kegs that are super shiny inside. My other used kegs have never looked that shiny. As long as they're clean, does it matter? Question mark. If it matters... What is your recommendation for getting them shiny effectively and quickly? I don't know why I said the word question mark. I guess I'm used to voice texting. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess the used kegs are the Chinese kegs because when we got them uh, more or the Italian, like they're new, uh, right. as far, Italian, like, not, yeah. not soda kegs, mm -hmm. but they're like new manufactured within the last 10 years because they came shiny with like shiny insides. How you know you that's that's interesting. I've I've gotten um, I had a new keg myself that the beer I put into it came out kind of metallic tasting, and um, I dumped that one and brewed again, and it was fine. Um, you don't have to passivate. Number one, that's that's one thing to get out of the way. What you do want to do is take um, dry paper towels and wipe it out if you can, if you can get your arm in there, get your kids to do it. You know, say, hey, kids, <laughs> you can't watch TV until you clean this keg. That's right. um, you know, dry paper towels, you'll, when you do that and you wipe, you'll, they'll often come out gray. And it's just met oxides that are on there. Um, washing them, drying them out, um, putting beer maybe you mean you know sometimes you may need to go get some dry malt extract from the homebrew store make up some wort and let that wort sit in the keg for a couple of days then dump it out because that will condition the keg that'll leach off whatever is going to leach off and you know take that aroma that uh, flavor and off off flavor with it um but passivation is not needed. That's that's for sure. Um, clean steel, clean stainless steel, and I mean, you know, water. When you pour water on it, the water doesn't, you know, draw into rivulets. It just it's a solid sheet coming down the panel. That's a clean stainless steel surface. That stainless steel surface is passive. It is clean. It's passive. It's corrosion resistant. There's nothing more you need to do to it. Okay. Well, there you go, William. I hope it answers your question. All right. Let's jump into fermentation. Now, we sort of have a lot to cover on this, uh, and I hope we'll get to it all. But if not, maybe we'll just do this again. Maybe we'll have you on Dr. Homebrew and okay. finish this topic up. I, I think that'd be a that. lot of fun, too. Um, so we just had the general topic of pressure and <laughs> fermentation and ester production and maturation were sort of like what we were what we were riffing on on riffing on on and on but i think we should talk about pressure and fermentation because that has come up a couple of times i think it even brian uh we talked about it on dr homebrew a couple of times i think someone asked about uh, fermentation under pressure as far as to drive some more esters for a saison i think or something i can't remember what the actual thing was but yeah, i think that was you know maybe a, a few months ago yeah so let's get into that a little bit. What role does okay. pressure play in fermentation and, and do we want that in our beer? Okay. When we talk about pressure in fermentation, we're talking about overpressure. Um, so like capping the fermenter and allowing pressure to build up inside the fermenter mm -hmm. up to say an additional atmosphere at the most. 
um, you know, from 14 PSI to say 20, 28 PSI. Generally, you're talking about like just a half atmosphere, so another seven PSI, so taking it from 14 up to 20 or 21. What that does is it increases the amount of dissolved carbon dioxide in the beer. And because carbon dioxide is a waste product of the yeast, um, you know, it's, it slows down their growth. And so that is the effect of pressure on fermentation. It slows down the growth of yeast, both okay. physical growth, um, increasing lag time, if that's what, where you're at, and as well as reproduction. Now, when yeast reproduce, they have a, 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 they need a set of nutrients. They need amino acids. They need fatty acids and other lipids from the wort um, to synthesize nutrients and compounds that they use to grow, just like other living cells. One of those things is called acetyl-CoA, um, and it's, it's a very short chain fatty acid. Think of it as the smallest Lego piece, you know, that little two piece, you know, two mm. spot Lego piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or the one spot where like, it's like a light. Like yeah, 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 that little whatever, bitty one yeah. that you you lose and you step on at like eleven o'clock when your the lights are off <laughs> and you get a glass of water. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I know those real well. Okay, so the, you know that small Lego piece it can be used anywhere, and that's what it's used for in the cell. Whenever they're when yeast cells grow, they synthesize uh, nutrients that they can't immediately take in from the wort. Mm -hmm. So they're saying, okay, I've got these amino acids coming in, but I need valine. So I'm going to synthesize valine. Well, they'll grab something else that's coming through the door and tear it apart, throw on some acetyl-CoA and other parts that they have handy to make the amino acid or the fatty acid that they actually need at that moment in time. When they do that, there are other pieces left over. And these other pieces left over are often medium chain fatty acids um, or uh, higher alcohols, and they need to detoxify themselves. They got these, this extra shit in the cell that they got to get rid of. That's where esters come in. Esters ah, are a detoxification okay. step where they take excess um, medium chain fatty acids that, you know, from synthesizing other fatty acids that they need and say, okay, I'm going to take this and take this alcohol that I've just made, put them together and excrete them out of the cell as an ester. Really? It's gone. Yeah. That's I, I how don't think I ever fully understood that. It, it's, it's beyond me as a metallurgist, but mm. I've been working <laughs> to understand it these last few years. Yeah. And um, so there's two types of esters. There's medium chain fatty acid esters, which are your like your um, ethyl hexano hexanoate, um, which is an apple smelling apple skin smelling ester. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. And then there are your ethyl esters, and your ethyl esters are formed with these acetyl CoA these short Lego pieces, and when the when the yeast get to the end of um, the lag phase, they get to the end of the growth phase and they say, okay, um, we're done, we're done reproduction. Now I've got all this excess small Lego piece left over. I'm gonna esterify these and get them out of here. Those are your ethyl esters, your ethyl the alcohol, ethyl acetate, banana, general fruit, those kind of esters, those get produced then. So it's like, it's like, here's all the, I, I've stored all this fat to grow and grow and grow. I don't need them anymore because we have, we've somehow figured out that we have enough yeast now to start doing the sugars. So yeah. we, can, we can lose all this weight <laughs> for lack of a better, yeah. we can eject all this, we can jettison it all and then start chewing on stuff. Or maybe it happens simultaneously, I would imagine. I right. Think. Um, and then that's where all this, the banana, like you're saying, is developing as fermentation is happening. Right, right. Yeah. The faster the yeast grow, the more waste products they produce. 
So this is why we talk about, you know, starting cool and then warming up during the fermentation. You know, kind of like the Belgian method where you start cool and then let it free rise. Right. Because by starting cool, you slow down the rate of growth and you slow down the amount of waste they do. And then as they get rolling, then they attenuate very well. They get, you know, they you reach your final gravity and the maturation period to clean up those byproducts is pretty short, especially at a warmer temperature where the yeast are more active. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, generally that's good. Uh, so um, let's let's discuss the opposite way as a contrast. So I'm promoting here uh, what's called the Narcissus fermentation, where you start cool, allow the fermentation to proceed, and then get warmer, free rise towards the end of fermentation, mm -hmm. and do a warm diacetyl rest. Um, and then you keep the beer at that warmer temperature, warmer than your primary, than your initial fermentation temperature. Uh, and that keeps the yeast activity high, and then they clean up their byproducts, the diacetyl and the acetaldehyde. Whereas if you start warm, the yeast are very active, they're taking in lots of nutrients, they're reproducing real fast, they're growing, they're generating lots and lots of waste. And now if you started warm and then start cooling that fermentation down in your refrigerator or whatever, the yeast slow down and they're gonna run out, they're gonna run out of sugars, but they're saying, eh, I'm too tired. Look at all that waste. Fuck it. I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. Okay. And they don't maturate the beer, or if they do, it's going to take weeks. So that's kind of like traditional vloggering, or at least yeah. the way we, we were doing it, where we would do a primary fermentation at, say, you know, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 10 degrees Celsius, and then start cooling that fermentation down. Well, the right. yeast are generating lots of waste products, they're growing, fermenting. And then you start cooling them down and they're not as active and they're not as you know, interested in cleaning up the diacetyl and acetaldehyde. Mm -hmm. So therefore you've got to wait six weeks, eight weeks for them to clean it up. Now, the thing about a long cold maturation is that you're also doing the clarification part of the brew where you're physically clarifying the beer. The yeasts are settling, the haze is settling, you know, clarification is happening better at cold temperatures. Right. And that's why, you know, traditional lager fermentation worked is because all of this was happening over a long period of time. But in modern brewing, yeah, we start cool, we finish warm, we do a you know a diacetyl rest, and we do you know VDK tests. You know the diacetyl, smelling the beer, um, heating it up to mash temperatures, and then cooling down, smelling again, smelling for any additional diacetyl, and making sure that the the yeast have sufficient time to maturate the beer to eliminate those two uh, off flavors, acetal and diacetyl. And then you go into the clarification stage where you chill the beer, drop the haze, drop the yeast. And that only takes a week to 10 days, depending you know, on other factors like calcium content. And so, you know, you shortened your, your finished lager beer time to something like two to three weeks versus two to three months. When you say, because you're you're starting to make me pucker uh, down in my bathing suit area, mm. say this because there's nothing I hate more. Well, you know that's clear. Yes. Um, than a rushed lager. I don't like it. I I think I can taste it, but I also think a lot like hazy beers, brewers are starting to learn how to do it better. Yeah. I have had like quote rushed lagers, but it's like four weeks instead of eight. Yeah. Or, or three that are like, okay, I, yeah, whatever. But so when you say start cool and, and, and go warm, how warm are you talking specifically when we're talking about lagers? 
Um, depends on your yeast, but okay. Okay. in general, if you say start at 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is eight to 10 C. Yeah. Um, do that for the first day or two of after pitching and then letting that rise a couple degrees, finish the beer at say 55, maybe even 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Do your diacetyl rest at 60 versus 50. That's like a 10 degree Fahrenheit or five degree C difference. Mm -hmm. um, that helps keep that yeast active. They were used to working at the cooler temperature. And now, and, and again, pitching rate comes into play as well. You have to have a sufficient amount of healthy yeast to ferment the beer at those temperatures. Uh, and, and the idea is that you're going to, they're going to run out of fermentable sugars before they have stopped reproducing. So there's, they're still ready to go. They're still ready to okay. eat. They're still hungry. Sugars are gone. Ah, byproducts. We can eat those. We can eat the diacetyl. We can eat that acetaldehyde provides us the energy we need. Finish our growth. Interesting. And then, okay, well, there's nothing left. We might as well flocculate and settle out. That's what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep them active up till the job's done. Okay. And then you can clarify, you can drop the temperature and settle everything. And, you know, fermentation is not done until maturation is done. Once maturation is done, now you can chill and clarify. Okay. That sounds like just the, the, uh, age arc of human beings right yeah it's like we're yeah. fermenting we're still cooking oh we're mature now we're mm. 50 or 60 we can just chill until we're done yeah, yeah. um mm. how much does the the actual aging process and i'm talking um you know the 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 what am i what am i talking Bo about the the amount of time that the beer is aging cold in in the old way versus the new way how much does that play on flavor development do you know what i mean because if you're, yeah. eight, you're logging complicated your beer question. for eight weeks yeah if you're logging your beer for eight weeks because you fermented cold and kept it cold versus lagering your beer for three weeks because you did the narcissist method or whatever it's called then that's still like a five week difference so does that does that play into things yes and stuff okay one yeah. So the caveat to what I've just said is that we do not understand the uh, elimination of sulfur compounds in lager beer at okay. this point. Okay. To the best of my knowledge, as the editor in chief of the Master Brewers Association of the Americas and the tech and the editor for the Technical Quarterly, uh -huh. having read lots of articles. We apparently do not really understand how sulfur elimination happens. And uh, you talk to a lot of brewers that do lagers, and they swear by a long, cold lagering yeah. to eliminate sulfur. Right. We don't know how that works. Um, but just in, that, that it works. It, that it seems to work. So we're now, trying to figure out a better yeah. way to do it. I guess. Yeah. Okay. So the Narcissus method, this is named after Dr. Ludwig Narcissus of uh, um, Weinstaffan and, and the VLB there in, in Munich. Um, sure. He, he promoted this as a way to, and he developed the 34, I maybe I'm wrong here. I think he developed, or at least he very promoted the 3470 strain, the Weinstaffan 3470 strain. Okay. Nice. Which is a great lager yeast. Um, and again, you I, I need to cover myself and say that, um, <laughs> you know, it, when we're talking about fermentations and optimum fermentations, we, we need to specify which, which yeasts we're talking about because they do differ. In general, most lager yeasts will respond to a warm maturation favorably. Um, the 3470 definitely does. Uh, let's see, where was I going? Okay. So 
Yeah, if if the yeast, like say German ale or I'm sorry, German lager yeast, produces a lot of sulfur dioxide, and has that burnt match smell in the beer, chances are a longer lagering uh, time would have helped eliminate that. But we, like I said, we don't really know the mechanism. Um, it doesn't seem to be yeast driven. The yeast definitely produce the sulfur dioxide, but we're not sure how it gets eliminated. Maybe it gets eliminated physically by venting. Mm -hmm. Maybe it gets chemically reacted with other constituents in, in the wort, you know, oxidation redox reactions with other compounds that are in the beer. Um, not really sure. Uh, oxidation certainly plays a role in sulfur compounds and, and final aromas. And so you were asking about how, how aging affects beer flavor. In higher gravity, more dextrinous words, beers, um, yeah, you know, the oxidation products of some of the alcohols and some, and some of the esterification of the alcohols that can take place um, really adds to the flavor of, you know, Baltic porters and barley wines and so on. In the case of an IPA, it makes that hop character go away. In the case of a ESB or a mild, that how those oxidation character just kill it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's a whole you know you're entering into a whole nother ballpark when you start talking about aging of different styles and different compositions of beer. But in terms of lager, in terms of talking about diacetyl reduction, acetaldehyde reduction, that is definitely unequivocally a yeast-driven function and occurs better at warmer temperatures where the yeast are more active. Okay. I think I got it. Okay. <laughs> I think. I don't know. It's here. I don't know. If, I don't know how long it will stay. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Shar, what do you think? Do you have any questions for uh, for Palmer on that? You know, uh, I, see, I was. I see your wheels bit, turning. My my wheels were thinking about like fusel alcohols because when I think high temperature fermentation, ah. I think fusels and they are nasty and they stay. And my my guess is that the yeast don't reprocess those that they 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 spit those out when they're extremely stressed and hot yep uh and there's non-temperature controlled fermentation and they stay and don't go away is that is that correct that is correct and that is another reason why we like to start fermentations on the cool side to slow down the yeast growth rate by right. slowing down that yeast growth rate they don't they don't produce as many fusel alcohols right and they have more time to esterify them as they do produce them. When it's when you're starting warm, fermenting warm, that when that when the temperature say five, ten degrees high, you know, higher than normal, mm -hmm. that they're they're burning through those sugars, you know, as fast as they can, because it's all it's all there. They're they're eager. That's when they're producing lots of fusels and. It takes to, you know, and if they're spitting them out of the cell to get rid of them so they can eat more, they're not going to get esterified. And that's where you need long maturation times of, say, like bottle conditioning, barrel aging, and so on right. to, the, to eventually esterify those fusels um, and, and, you know, make them pleasant. Um, yeah. Easy way to avoid that is to not create them in the first place. <laughs> have have temperature controlled fermentation, and that's that's one of the one of the uh, issues with, with homebrew that you know I don't see as much as I did, you know, fifteen yeah. years ago. But you still get it sometimes, or people are, are are brand new and they think, oh, I'll put this bucket in my closet in the hallway, it'll be yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, and they come back uh, in a day or two, and like, well, my beer is already fermented, great. Uh, but it tastes like fusel alcohol, like nail yeah. polish and this nastiness. Right. Brian, what, what year did you start homebrewing? Oh, 1849. God. 1849. It, uh, it was <laughs> in the 20th century. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, I'm guessing 91, 92. Okay. About the, the shortly after I, I started around 1990. 
Yeah. Um, and the yeasts that we had back then, there were three of them. <laughs> mm. yeah. You know, what they do we got today? Dry. Yeah, we got like 200 yeasts today. At least. Probably. So, yeah, I mean, there are, and that is a big technological achievement. And the, the variety and the stability and the integrity, the, you know, the robustness of the yeast we have today to work with yeah. reduces the amount of off flavors that we would get from our fermentation. So we could ferment higher. I mean, 30 fermentus for 3470 is the closest thing to a bulletproof yeast I've ever used. Hmm. Uh, you know, in terms of makes sense. It, you know, you can ferment that at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you can ver ferment it at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and still get a very clean lager like beer. You know, right around 50 is probably optimal for log for a clean, low ester lager like beer, pitching rate and so on and so on and so on. But I mean, one of the last the last batch of Munich Dunkel I did, um, I I at the moment I don't have refer, uh, fermentation temperature control in my house. I've got my beer fridge, which is set cold, mm -hmm. and I've got the Southern California temperate climate, mm -hmm. but that's it. So the last time I brewed my Dunkel, it was kind of warm, but I thought, well, I'll just use thirty four seventy. It's about 70 degrees, oh. it should be okay. And it was all right. And it's not, it's not as good as I would like it to be. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as a seasoned beer judge and experienced homebrewer, I know it's not perfect, but it's very drinkable. It's a 30 instead of a 35. I would, yeah, I would, I would say it's a <laughs> 34, 35 instead of a four, 34 okay. as opposed to a 38. That's gotcha. not bad, man. You know, no, that's still really good. And that's a good yeah. point where, you know, people would go, oh, well, John Palmer wrote literally the book on how to brew. I expect all of his beers to be 50s because he knows what he's doing. But sometimes I, I, this, yeah. I pick up this phrase from Jamil. He said, uh, the cobbler's children have no shoes. Yeah. Where it's like, essentially, you can teach people and talk about it all day long, but sometimes you don't want to do it. And just because yeah. you have the knowledge doesn't mean that you give a shit. Right. Like mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing wrong when I'm rushing something or when I don't fully clean the transfer tube. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm risking and I don't care at the moment. Right. Right. doesn't mean I don't know anything. It just means that I am lazy. I'm a human being like <laughs> everybody else. You, you've made the judgment that, yeah, this, this will be close enough. This will, this should work. Yeah. Mm. And if it doesn't work, I know why. That's right. <laughs> and then I can't right. mad at myself. Yeah. I um, remember thinking back to when I started brewing, John, or uh, 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 my friend Eric, uh, Eric Thorpe, you may, may have known. I think he was from like DC, MD 11. He was more of the aircraft side of, okay. of yeah. Douglas. Yeah. Uh, he showed me this paper bag he had. He had like these brown little cones in there. And I'm thinking, is this marijuana? Uh, and no, it was hops. And that was how you got hops in like 1991 is they came in a brown paper bag, unsealed whole cone. And yeah. they were brown and nasty because they've been oxidized the whole time. Right. Uh, so that was uh, just one of those. Yeah. Just the quality of ingredients overall, not just yeast today. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. So late years ahead of what we had available 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, Equipment ingredients knowledge i mean we're no yes. longer a yes, lot of people right. aren't doing secondary fermentations anymore and it's like thank god yeah. Yeah. yeah um all right let's take a quick break uh palmsy and we'll come back and we'll wrap things up by just running through the chat with some questions very good Is that good see you in a minute all right all right everybody hang on it's the session we'll be right back all right thanks for sticking around everyone we're gonna wrap things up here by cruising through the chat and looking for live questions questions that have come in but more importantly i've just cracked another beer the hellas from urban roots whoa oh, nice i am lucky enough to have uh, a friend called brad who goes nice. uh, to sacramento every now and then and he he knows now he knows that, better. that's Pete not come career, back right yep yep Nice. And apparently Peter does the loggers and like the saisons and like some other guy does all like the ales. Oh, really? That's what okay. I've heard. And I don't know oh, if that's nice. true, but like, so 
Oh, the loggers are delish. And then he has, they have a half called the floofster. Mm-hmm. Which oh. is just like Esther production heaven. Nice. It's very good. It's one of those well-balanced Esther, like German hefts. Yeah. Delicious. Nice. Uh, delicious. But yeah, all the loggers, like basically that's all I got. I got a pack of the Czech pills, this fucking Hellas. I got um, mm. their uh, Me- dark Mexican lager. Mm. And, nice. Um, the one of my yeah. favorites. Yeah. yeah, it's good. I, I love Hefeweizen so much. It is. I like never Francis did. Francis Connor is like one of my favorites. Do. Yeah. And this back year- when Gordon Biersch made like their... Uh, their their dunkel hefeweizen the dunkels? like about 10 years ago oh, oh my so- god their their dark hefeweizen was like liquid crack i would go yeah. buy like two or three six packs from safeway like every week and yeah. i would just drink that that dark hefeweizen forever they haven't done it for forever unfortunately yeah no it was seasonal and it was very good well brian you yeah. know what if you if you happen to come out here and i still have one of these cans left i'll give it to you how about that thanks man i appreciate that all right, so Charles says, how important is water chemistry when it comes to making a good beer? And then he says, in parentheses, not pH adjustments. <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure what it means, but water chemi- like some mineralities, I, I suppose, if you're not talking about yeah. pH, but doesn't, don't minerals adjust the pH? They do. Calcium and bicarbonate and magnesium affect pH. Calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate are the ones that affect pH. Um, here's the thing about brewing water. Most water will successfully, I mean, almost all water will successfully mash and create wort because the enzymes, the amylase enzymes actually work better at higher pH than they do at lower pH. But where you get improvements in beer flavor in terms of you know, during the boil, the boil chemistry, hop utilization and hop flavor is at the lower pHs, the 5.2 to 5.6 range. That's why we shoot for 5.2 to 5.6 in our mash is because the enzymes still working well there. But when you go to the, when you take that wort and go to the boil kettle, the hop character is a little more refined. It's not as coarse. Um, you get a better beer flavor. You get a clearer beer protein coagulation is better and so on and so on at lower, a little lower pH versus higher pH. So that's, that's why that's the main reason we do water adjustment are are those considerations. Secondary to that is your flavor ions, your um, sulfate, chloride, and sodium. So you know, if, if you know what your starting water is, you know what your water profile is, you can do salt adjustments to boost the chloride or boost the sulfate to accentuate the hoppy beer or accentuate the malty beer and adjust flavor a little bit, you know, flavor a little bit that way. But the secret to water adjustment, or I should say not the secret, but the, the, big, the big banner that everyone misses is you can't change you can't create flavors that aren't there you can't Mm -hmm. add more sulfate to a non-hoppy beer to make it hoppy you can't add lots of chloride to a hoppy beer you know in a single malt hoppy beer to make it malty it you know you're only accentuating what's already there you're seasoning your food so um I think they, I think my sons are burning dinner. Um, <laughs> Speaking of seasoning uh, food, yeah, yeah, I'm just smoking shitty meat. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you if you want to adjust water, you need to understand pH. You need to understand residual alkalinity and how that affects pH, wort pH, beer pH. Because beer pH is what affects the final flavor of your beer. A very acidic beer is going to taste thin, but very bright on the tongue. Whereas a higher pH beer is going to taste a little rounder, a little fuller. But if you go too high in pH, that fullness overflows and becomes coarse and broad and and bleh. Is flabby a, a descriptor for that? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Right. 
So many people brew pale ales with high carbonate water, hoppy pale ales, and they love the coarse, harsh bitterness that they get, you know, whereas if you controlled the pH control, you know, and controlled the wort pH and the beer pH, that bitterness would not be so harsh. It would still be there. It would be punchy, but it would not linger on the palate and it would get you ready for that next drink because you was like, that was really good. I want some more. And it wouldn't linger and wouldn't build up. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And you've got it. People have to be careful when they're adjusting their, uh, their water because we've had beers on Dr. Homebrew. I've judged beers in competition that have a character that I always refer to as like licking a rock. Hmm. And yeah. if yep. you don't know what you're starting with, and you just follow blindly some advice to, oh, put in X amount of you know, salt, X amount of gypsum, something, then you end up with a very overly mineral character. Yeah. And that's when you start down that road of water adjustment, you've got to know what you're starting with. You've got to know, uh, be able to measure what you're adding and know yeah. why you're adding it and not just blindly add things because somebody said to add a teaspoon of this and a teaspoon of that. Yeah. The whole Burtonization thing. I mean, people look up the water profile of Burton on Trent. It's horrendous. <laughs> um, <laughs> the brewers of Burton on Trent don't brew with that water. <laughs> that was the no, well they don't water. Yeah. That was the groundwater test. They brewed with wells that were situated next to the river, so they got a blending, a dilution of that well of the groundwater mm -hmm. with the with the river water, okay. and you know, and so they yeah they got some high sulfate, but three hundred, not seven hundred. You know, right. um, they got calcium a hundred, not three hundred, and that makes all the difference. I mean. Yeah, do um, do not do not pour a half a cup of Epsom salts in your water to make a Burtonized beer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Not pleasant. We were yeah. trying at more beer years and years ago. We were trying to to develop these little like kits, yeah. where it already had the amount. You know, if you start with RO water, yeah, this is the amount that you would add back, and and you combine all those chemicals. And we didn't really know this. Put them in a plastic bag. You started to react and off gas. Oh those, man, those bags would like puff. And we're like, oh, okay, oh well, we need to rethink this. And then that's, uh, but, um, wow, you know, that's so that, really interesting. Yeah. Well, because and also back then early two thousands, this is exactly what you're saying, Palmer. Everyone goes, well, Bert, you got to burtonize. This is the replicating the, the water. And at, at some point I, I forget even who, where I heard it from, but at some point it's like, they don't, if you go there, they don't brew with this water. Everybody treats their water. Everybody. Yes. Yep. Just everybody. And that's it. I remember, uh, like the guy, crazy Dave at the hop, Hop yard brewing. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Hop yard. Yeah. He would go, no, Pleasanton gives <clears throat> great water for dark beers. And that's what I was using at the time too. And I'm like, yeah, he goes, no, I just carbon filter. So like for the most part, everybody does, but some people carbon filter, but you know, you're adding sulfates or this or calcium or whatever. You're, you're doing something to your water to change it a little bit. Rarely, yeah. if ever, can you just bring it right out of the tap, throw it through a carbon filter and be, and call it good. I think yeah. with your darker beers, you can, but like lighter beers and pale ales. So for me personally, I, I have a hard time brewing anything like under like 20 SRM or whatever. Mm. Darker beers I can do pretty well. Lighter yeah. beers, pale ales never have that, that hop pop. They never have that crispness for me. And I know it's because of my water. Yeah, I just know it is, but I'm, t I don't care enough to learn about it. It's what it comes down to. I just don't yeah. care. You know, I, that's, um, I brew a lot of um, amber beers myself because that's what LA water is suited for. Yeah. When I do brew pale beers, I have to go to the grocery store and buy, you know, three, four containers of distilled water and then build it from there. Right. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, Richard in the chat says, uh, he says, I'm on several Facebook homebrew groups. And I have to say some homebrewers out there have equipment that can only be described as professional brewing equipment. <laughs> when does homebrewing become professional or what defines a homebrewer? And I know he's not asking specifically for our feedback or, or a definition of a homebrewer, but I thought it was interesting because it sort of ties into the whole things have fucking changed. Yes. You go on yeah. Instagram and there's just all of these dudes 
with just stainless kitted out everywhere. You don't see a piece of copper. Right. Yeah. And back in my day. Plastic. Yeah. Yeah. First, yeah. Yeah. The plastic uh, fills false bottoms. You right. Know, uh, you know, oh, uh, whoa, someone uh, made uh, these out of, you know, plastic. Wow. And then now it's like, bro, I got a fermentation jacket yeah. <laughs> for my stainless. Your, your brew system's not titanium. Where yeah. have you been? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can hide in this thing in a nuclear attack, and I'd be fine. I just can't. I <laughs> ordered mine for out of vibranium, right from Wakanda, because that's <laughs> totally not uh, reactive, and mine's better than yours. There's a certain amount of dick measuring at a certain point uh, mm -hmm. with some of that stuff, but I mean, just I'll just to jump in first year for a second. You know, I've known people that have made fantastic beer on amazing twenty barrel systems at home. They've made themselves. Uh, and they've you know built pieces and this and that, that they've bought the whole thing, that they've made amazing beer on the stovetop with a freaking pasta pot and stuff. Your, your equipment doesn't define how good of a brewer you are. And your equipment should reflect like how you like to brew and how much you want to brew. Like we were talking at the very beginning of the show, I'm, I'm done brewing 10 gallons at a time that yeah. that ain't gonna happen i don't have when my daughter was real young we used to have a big party for people from daycare like literally once every three four weeks and people would drink 10 gallons of beer because we'd have 50 60 people over yeah. uh i don't have that kind of people coming over to my house anymore yeah. and then uh, slowly so, everybody's kids started looking the same and i don't i know it's are. amazing <laughs> um, <laughs> all shared genetics Tell you about the time that I had the Baltic Porter that I, I won the People's Choice at NCHF uh, like 10 years back, uh, 12 years back. And uh, despite all my warnings and all the 10 percent and exclamation points and verbal warnings, I can't tell you how many uh, moms and dads were asleep in my living room at the uh, end of Friday <laughs> night. Like, oh, you guys got to go home. You got to get You got to get out now. Uh, yeah. But you know, your, your equipment reflects it. like or if you plan to enter a lot of comps, right? If you're the type of brewer that likes to enter, you know, 50 comps a year, you're going to make 10 gallon batches. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, if you, if you understand fermentation, if you understand sanitation, if you understand the basics of recipe formulation, you're going to make good beer regardless of the hardware you use to do it. Right. And then that the hardware used to do it becomes a matter of personal choice and what you what you want to focus on as a brewer. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I love my 10 gallon system, but yeah. the amount of time it would take to clean it up afterwards was just a pain in the ass. Oh, yeah. That's, that's an I, hour. That's an hour, hour and a half cleanup yeah. when you're done. And you've already had a long brew day outside with that that propane tank. It's a fun yeah. brew day. Yeah, but you've had to heat up all that water and then brew, and then it's like became, dinner time. It's like, oh crap! I still have to clean all this. Yeah, yeah. it became work. It became yeah. a job. And, yeah, and that's why I like the the shift towards more of a semi automation or an automation. I'm sad Pico Brew went under. Yeah, because they were they were putting out. I mean, they had they had problems. They had a good problem. You know, like good every product, product, but yeah, good product, but it gave you your life back. And that's why I like yes. the Brazilla because it's fast. In under six hours, you can do five gallons. Mm -hmm. I like and it. One and vessel to clean up. One vessel. Yes. And it was great. It, it is great. So um, I like that sort of shift for me personally. But I also like that there's probably infinite number of ways to approach mashing and fermentation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Tuck in the chat says, if we want to understand astringency, what would we spike our beer with to know, oh, that's what astringency is? <laughs> Suck on a plain Lipton tea bag. <laughs> and yeah. the tag, take, I mean, take the tea bag, put uh -huh. it in your mouth. Tea bag is astringency. Call your best friend mm. and have tea bag you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or if you have like oak cubes or something, hey, yeah. a chunk of wood, that's a good way to go too. Is there is there something he can put in his beer? Because I have a feeling he wants to know what it tastes like within like the malty hoppy concoction of whatever whatever style he's made. Um Take some. Uh, you put like a tea bag in. You're gonna get tea flavor. Yeah, if you take um, oak, like Brian said, and boil that in some water, and oh, then yeah. add that tincture to the beer, that'll give you 
Down. Or what if you took just oh, a handful yeah. of your of your mash? After yeah. You're done sparging. Yeah. Handful of that and throw that in some boiling water and then steep that and then and then pour that out and then you can taste yes. that and maybe Ooh, that's a good idea. No your yeah. that. That would that would also yeah. you just taste that that spent grain tea. Mm -hmm. That would be a very good indication of this. Yeah. To say, yeah. Uh, and then Danny says, is it possible to get a list of BJCP homebrew judges? I feel like no. I feel like that's just, <laughs> no. that's a well. I'm I'm pretty sure that BJCP.org has a list of the active oh, roster somewhere. Okay. Oh, I was gonna say that sounds like a knock list or like a wet list or whatever. Like someone's um, gonna come but, knocking on my door in about three weeks and yeah, uh, but bust gotta, a cap in my ass like before 5, I move to my new people. house. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then he says, are there any levels of certification like with Cicerone? Yes, of course. Oh, yeah, like there's yeah. recognized, which is which is me. Then there's Grandmaster a million, which is Brian Shaw. Mm. <laughs> various levels. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not Dave Techum or one of those guys that really works his ass off. But you're Grandmaster three. Just a one. I'm a one. Just a one. Oh, okay. Well, then fuck you. Why did I get exactly? You one? Yeah, I'm only <laughs> I'm only certified because I've just never found it worth my time to take the test to hit national. But I've been judging Fair for enough. thirty years. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's the thing, right? Like I was national for a long time and I was pretty happy being national. And I kind of got to a point maybe about 10 years ago of, you know, I'm going to try to make the push and be uh, a master. And then once you're master, there you go. it's easy to kind of move up to grandmaster at, at, at that point. And, I, you know, I really, I, I do think that you and, and Brian Cooper need to talk to BGCP folks and you guys need credit for the shows for dr homebrew shows we, I mean, we joke about it but yeah, hey I'm, yeah. I'm all for getting some grandmaster service points for doing the show you should because it's it's furthering education yeah you're exactly. you're, you're literally judging four beers every month and providing feedback i mean there's no it would be complete nonsense for someone not to recognize yeah. that and we're trying to put it put accurate and good information out to people about yeah. about beer and the competition process and encourage people to take part well, I think, and I think we do that because of the feedback, because of the, the, the brewer is on the phone. Yeah. We get to learn about it too. So anyway, yeah. um, so we'll, 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 maybe Cooper and I will chat about that. He's a, should, a BJCP rep and maybe we'll see what he can do for us. Yeah. Um, get, uh, get Gordon strong on the phone. Uh, Rob, uh, Ron says, what do you think of these podcasts that do experiments each week and almost always conclude that nothing really matters at the homebrew scale? Well, and I figured this would come up, and I'm pretty yeah. excited about it either way because I have my own opinions. But what do yeah. you think, Palmer? I mean, Brewlosophy is an example. It is a great site, and um, what's interesting, you know, what's interesting to me is that half of what I say in how to brew has been contradicted or at least not borne mm -hmm. out by the experiments that they do. The short and shoddy brews, for example, uh, are an interesting indication of, you know, there's a lot of robustness in the brewing process where you can do a half-assed brew, but if you're hitting all the right points along the way, it's going to be a good beer. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's sort of like a, you don't need to obsess over things like extraction. Right, right. Just as long as you're not getting off flavors, yeah. you can adjust on the fly later on and you're, and yeah. you're, you're going to make it okay. So much of what I obsess about and probably what you guys obsess about in Dr. Homebrew is putting out the best advice possible. What's the best practice that you can recommend to somebody mm -hmm. to make good beer? And, you know, even so even if they don't follow that best advice to the letter, They'll get 90% and they'll brew a good beer because we're trying to help people brew good beer. So um, I'm, I'm addressing for an article I'm writing for an Australian magazine, Kettle Souring, and um, the pre-acidification of the, of the wort to 4.5 to prevent, you know, the growth of enteric bacteria and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the short boil before chilling and so on. I mean, um, all of this is recommendations to produce the best beer possible to the highest chance of success. But you go to a number of commercial breweries, they don't do those steps. 
because they know from experience from you know if we do if we hit our pitching rate and we hit our time period between you know this temperature and pitching rate and this temperature we're going to be fine you know it's going to acidify fast enough the head retention is not a problem you know growth of external bacteria is not a problem it, it will be fine and we can skip those steps so i guess i mean that's a roundabout way of answering that guy's question but yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of have a few thoughts, but we don't have a lot of time left. And I guess like that 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 show is really entertaining and engaging. Uh, but something has to matter at some point. Otherwise, you throw like a baseball and three cans of orange juice concentrate in an aluminum uh, uh, bucket, and you're going to get a stout three three weeks later. You know, it's just something has to matter at some point. Yeah. Uh, and it gets views and listeners when you say would, would you burst people's bubbles about what they expect uh yeah i like marshall i think he's a good dude he's very smart he's fun to oh, listen yeah. to i love having him on the show uh, but and i've said this to his face on on our show because i feel comfortable on our show um that i i think a lot of these things are subjective you know you can have a, a sample size of 20 people or 15 people but they're 15 people at the bar right and and i know and i think he said before uh, either that or I'm putting words in his mouth, so I apologize. But it's like when doing all these, you do have a hard time finding a sample size. Sometimes you get right. 12 people tasting a beer. And it's like, okay, well, then if you're not at a certain statistical range of of the flavor mattering, then it doesn't matter. And he'll be the first to say, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't do this thing or that you should do this thing. He just means that when we did this thing, whatever it is, the result didn't matter to most people. And I think that's what a lot of people miss with his show. Yeah, it's that it's not he's not saying definitively never do this ever again, whatever this is, um, but that you can skirt the issue or you don't have to maybe worry about it. And I think if you look at it like like have fun with home brewing, you don't have to chase met the fifty point score. If you right. want to chase scores, right, then you can definitely do that. But there are certain things that you can reduce the stress on about uh, with, with about your brew day that you'll still make drinkable beer in the end. And yeah. I think that's really, I, I that's what I think. And I, I haven't said this specifically to him, but I think that's in general what the spirit of brewlosophy is. That that's a very good synopsis. I think. I mean, yeah, it's it's like so many things in life: driving, education, you know career we recommend we give advice to people and from that we hope there's a couple of takeaways that will help ensure their success they don't have to follow everything to the letter you know to get something that's perfect. right but um, okay i do want to get through all of these we're getting comments as we talk and we don't have a whole lot of time so Let's run through these real fast. Uh, Four hour okay. show, JP. Let's I do it. Four <laughs> hours. <laughs> Can't do it. I told Palmer six thirty, and it's already seven. Mm. So that's all right. Um, let's do let's do one here real fast, Palmer. And um, it's from Scott. He says, when you see a sample water profile, oh, fuck that, that includes HCO three minus. Okay, bicarbonate. Thank you. But you're using RO water. Do you okay. ignore HCO3 or do you add NaHCO3 to obtain those levels? Does HCO3 in your brewing water add character to the beer? Yes, that, that's a good question. Okay. So um, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer you to the brew cube in chapter 22 of the latest edition of How to Brew, Perfect. which is a Rubik's Cube kind of thing. And I may be able to throw it up on the screen real quick. Maybe not. Probably it's not worth it. But anyway, yeah. what we're doing is we're saying that residual alkalinity, the, in other words, the amount of bicarbonate in the water corresponds to the color level of the beer. Pale beer, you don't want bicarbonate. That would be your RO, RO waters. For amber beers, you want some bicarbonate because the amber specialty malts are providing some amount of acidity uh, to the mash. And for dark beers, you want a, a decent hefty amount of bicarbonate in the water because again, they're balancing the amount of acidic specialty malts that are in that grain bill. We're always shooting for that five, two to five, six 
mash to pH range. So that's that's why if you're if you're looking at a water profile for a classic brewing city, look at the kind of beer that comes from that city. Is it a pale amber or dark? Look at the amount of alkalinity and say, is that amount of alkalinity versus the hardness, the calcium and, and magnesium, uh, is that appropriate for that color? And that's where residual alkalinity comes in. And please read the book and I'll explain it better there. Um, but yes, you may want to add baking soda, for example, to your RO water to brew particular styles of beer, such as ambers and darks. Okay. All right. Um, this is, a, this is very, Terry, uh, can you guys talk about how to get good hop aroma in an IPA? Generic thoughts for how much aroma is from dry hopping, how much is from late edition, et cetera. That's a show. That's, yeah. a, that's a book. That's at least a chapter in a book. That's the new IPA book by our good friend. Damn it. Um, Steel? Scott. Scott. Oh, Scott J Janish. There you go. Scott Janish. Thank and the you. only reason I know that is because I fucking edited that show. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's a that great book. book. From Scott Janish. There, that, Terry, that's a great question, but there's a lot. Um, you know, dry hopping, is, you get different aroma than a late edition. And yes. so it depends on what you want. And that's really, you know, all that there is to say about that. I mean, um, if you want to have a lot of hop aroma, I think, you know, shit, go for it. Just put it in late, put late hops in, whirlpool them, dry hop it. Yep. They're all going to be different. If you want to have it be super aromatic, just keep jamming hops in everywhere from five minutes before the end of boil until the time you bottle it. <laughs> that's right. Um, Ron wants to know, John, are you working on a new book? And it blows his mind how much brewing information you know. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I am working on a new book slowly, sporadically called How to Brew in Your Kitchen. Small yeah. batches, simple, on the stove. Um, yeah, that's, that's it's kind of it's going to be kind of like an intro to how to brew. You know, this is this has you know got to would, be a very large book. It's a super large book. You know what I would love? Maybe in that. Well, I don't want to say like in that book or maybe it's split off, but would be like a, a, a book or a show or a series or something focused on, you know, median income of like 60 grand and up. Mm -hmm. It's like folks like us who are like, well, you know, I have three hundred dollars I can throw at a Bruzilla. How the fuck do I use this? Yeah, yeah. How do I do that? You know, that, like that's going to be science. this book. Oh, it's going to okay. be how to brew on your stove, how to brew in your kitchen, as well as the small all in ones, you know, the brewing for the apartment dweller. Okay. Yeah. Because, and, and this is where, this is where I'm stuck in my knowledge is when you said brewing at home, I instantly thought three and a half gallon kettle extract. And that's it. Like I didn't think anything beyond that because like, we're just, we're moving so fast. But I, yeah, okay, good. Well, see, there you go. So I, I, that, that's I, I get, I get at least ten percent off off the top of your yeah. Your for that, I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna try to keep it to about 120 pages. Okay. And you know what's funny yeah. is it's kind of like how people that get interested in brewing, how we all start, and then yeah. kind of as as we get older, 30 years later, and maybe and partly why I wanted to start brewing smaller is I've been drinking a lot less. Is you know, in 10 years I'm gonna be in my mid 60s. I don't want to be schlepping out a giant system from a shed to the backyard right. lifted up this and that and it's like yeah. I, i'm not sure i, I want to do that yeah. uh and the kids the so kids are going to live away from spaces. home there's gonna be yeah. no one to carry that you know right, <laughs> right. exactly <laughs> exactly steal it from you yeah. mm. um uh ron in chat says has john noticed any difference between the dry and the liquid 3470 which i think is an excellent question because that, is years, that mattered and i don't think it matters as much anymore probably doesn't i i actually have not brewed with the liquid 3470 okay i've always done dry all right well there you go ron john does not give a shit about figuring it uh, out uh, uh. um danny this is a comment to my secondary if you don't do a secondary fermentation how do you get your beer off the dead yeast and get a great dry hop to be clear there is no 
secondary fermentation and secondary fermentation, it, it's just a clarification process in which you could do that or by a conical fermenter. Yeah. Yeah. There was this, this thing like 50, there was a big issue I would see in judging like 15, 20 years ago where there'd be like a lot of off flavors and wordiness and stuff that came from, there was this fear of, Oh God, I cannot let my beer be on top of this yeast for yep. more than it's going to, I'll have autolysis flavors. Uh, and it was almost a terror of autolysis yeah. that if you're temperature controlling, that doesn't happen for like a month. Yeah. Uh, and if you're not temperature controlling, you need to be temperature controlling, but you would have people like drop their uh, primary into a secondary after like three days. Like, oh, I don't want to have autolysis of my beer. And they'd create other problems that came from uh, incomplete fermentation and you'd get acetaldehyde and yeah, yeah, it just was not, not a good thing. So I just, unless as you're saying, uh, JP, Unless you're trying to brew a really clear lager and part of your process is to go to a secondary just for a couple of days to clear it out. And maybe you combine that with some gelatin fining or something else. There's really no need to go to a secondary. That's right. Yeah, I, I do. When I brew lagers and I do brew them, you know, once, once a year or so, um, everything, you know, the whole fermentation and maturation happens in that single fermenter. Then I rack it to a keg and I carbonate it and chill it and it clarifies. That would be technically considered the secondary fermentation but or the right. lagering. But no, it is strictly clarification at this stage. Yeast settling out, hay settling out, done. Um, yeah. Fermentation happens when the yeast are warmer. Yeah. yeah. I, I had this conversation with Jamil like 15 years ago that I just, I am strong. I just, I do not believe in secondary fermentation. It's one more step that you can introduce bacteria or wild yeast into the process. Every time you touch that uncomplete beer, you're risking some kind of contamination. Yeah. yeah. And unless yeah. there's a powerful reason for it, just don't don't do it. It's not a yeah. good idea. In general, you don't need to do it. And you know what? I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna toot the horn of Christopher Graham because he was the one yeah. who sort of like you know he brought that to my attention because when I'm working there, I'm still learning. Um, and then I just brought it to the brewery network. And I remember getting into like literal arguments on the shows early mm -hmm. on about how you don't need to do secondary fermentation. Of course, I was I remember that too. That. Yeah, of course, I was a dickhead about it. I was a mm. big fucking bell end and be like, well, mm. fuck you. Um, <clears throat> I was on your side, though, in those shows, man. You, know, man. you didn't need to do it. You didn't need to do it. And then now it turns out it's, you know, it's funny. I'm just I'm just going to I'm just going to do this. Like, it's weird how influential <laughs> like the the you know, we've all of us have sort of like yeah, and yeah. it sounds really stupid to say, and I, I probably should edit this out, but it's like, mm. it's stuff that we've been talking about because we've been doing it for so long. And it's yeah. not that it's not that we're smarter than anybody else. It's that we've been doing it for longer than most people. And therefore we have seen the, the, the ups and downs of what is popular and what's not. And then sort of what everything shakes out in the bottom is, you know, cheap stainless steel and not worrying about shit. And yeah. that's how you have like the maximum fun. That's like the, the, yeah inverse curve no venn diagram maybe of yeah. brewing where it's like you have one circle that's fun one that's stainless and one that's not giving a shit and in the middle they all combine to form like a good time being a home brewer that's like vulture or something yeah. um okay last last one this is from patrick so if i got lazy and didn't clean my beer draft lines could i infect my entire keg yeah okay how does that work yep. though because if there's pressure building up i imagine it's like electricity where there's just the, the wires are live and you just got to flip the switch for the electricity to go in at the at the at the at the faucet yeah How well it... the the contamination can go from the faucet to the beer line and from the beer line because there's all no the way... close in the beer yeah. line. it's just that the faucet is closed but from the beer line to the bottom of your keg it's just one continuous yeah yeah all right and it's under pressure, but you know, that stuff, if it gets in that keg <laughs> valve, then there's, you know, there's microscopic ways for it to enter. And possibly even when that valve is open, all it takes is a few to get in and then they start multiplying. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, look, I think that was it. This has uh, been a good show. Palmer. It's been fun. Thanks, man. How can people learn more a little bit about uh, how to brew or what you're doing or anything you want to you know, sort of throw out there? Oh, um, I try to I try to post to Instagram and Facebook once in a while, but I'm stuck at social, social oh, you're media. you're terrible at it. No, you never mm. post anything. Mm. Except they, you know what? When you post is what here's what I'm grilling. True. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is uh, not which is fine, but it's like. What does John Palmer do? What's John Palmer's day like? This is this is what I tell every brewer who I talk to about social media. It's like I want to know. I don't want to. I don't want you to use Instagram as what your fucking tap specials are or what taco truck is showing up. I want to know what it's like working at your brewery. Oh, that's, that's why I follow point. you. You know what I mean? I don't don't yeah. you? I don't like it when people use it as a an advertising platform solely. You have to pepper that in, but it's much more of an intimate intimate look like i want to see your homebrew setup i want to see a picture of your mash tun okay. i want to see you homebrewing yeah i mean i also want to see you grilling because you know yeah. i'm a dude and dudes rock but yeah mm. this past week i've been in the forge i've been making a kukri knife i want to see this john wow. this Doing is what Damascus i want to ask a steel and stuff yeah this is what this no is shit. Exactly. seriously and yeah. you know what i want you to do i want you to set up your <laughs> webcam and I want you to fucking live stream it on Twitch yeah. or uh, whatever, or on Instagram Live. This is what uh -huh. I want for you. Okay. I want to see. I mean, you John, you're a metallurgist. Really this do. is like right in your sweet spot here, making this yeah. cool ass knife with Damascus steel. That would be really interesting. Seven o'clock this morning, I had I had the knife in a ferric chloride bath with electrodes wired wired up to it and trying to get the Damascus pattern to pop out. And I ended up wow. copper plating it instead. Uh, so I'm it's like, okay, I can't use uh, copper electrodes now. But, uh, um, uh, uh, okay. That's hilarious. Yeah. I guess, sad, but it's hilarious. I don't understand too. it. I just, all I know is you fucked up and it makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. This is, this is what I want. This is what I want, John. Okay. We should talk, we should talk about how to, how to, how to make your profile pop. Cause, uh, that's what I need. If I need. Oh yeah. man, my okay. stepson is totally into knives, and if you knew you were making like some Damascus steel knife thing, he would be like live streaming you like as many hours as it took to get done. I'm saying this is what this is what uh, people need. Um, all right, Palmer, thanks, man. I appreciate it. So, howtobrew.com, I yep. imagine his website. Yeah. Follow John Palmer on Instagram. I just imagine look John Palmer. Yeah, it's like how to brew underline the John Palmer or something like that or something. I forget. I, I think if you just enter into the search bar, how to brew Palmer, you'd probably get what you were looking for. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and then Brian Shar, thank you very much, man. I appreciate you. Uh, why don't you throw a plug out there? Why not? It's a session. Who oh, cares? thanks. Hey, if you guys, anybody out there looking for a uh, IP attorney, crosspondlaw.com. Uh, if you want to hear about some good uh, uh, homebrew judging and of good and or bad homebrew, listen to Dr. Homebrew. <laughs> good and or on the Brewing Network. Yeah. And you know what? Honestly, I'm, I'm saying I'm always saying this. This is so true. I'm always saying this. Um, we want bad beer because oh, yeah. this is how we learn. Not us, but this is how you learn. So if you have a shitty beer, people go, oh, I want to send in beer, but it just sucks. Like, good. If you, if, unless you already yeah. know. How oh, it yeah. Sucks. If you know why it sucks, don't fucking send it. Uh, but if you, uh, if you don't know why it sucks, then this is what we're here for. So send it in. To go uh, back to one of my very first times I ever judged, if your beer tastes like rosemary and dirt, you don't know why send it in send it in that's right all right everybody thanks a lot for tuning in i really appreciate it thank you very much to our sponsors of course title sponsor here being more beer go to morebeer.com um thanks of course to palmer and Shar, and uh for everybody listening on facebook we really appreciate it too and uh until next time we'll see you guys later cheers <laughs>